Hi, um, this is your little excursion into typography. All right, I'm not a native speaker, so I might mispronounce English words, but I know how to write them. So um, we are looking at who is using uh, Illustrator? Okay, who's using Photoshop? Who is frustrated by how you can access certain type things in, in Illustrator and Photoshop? Yeah, well, it gets better. Don't worry about it. So, oh, this is not working now. Oh, this is bad. Okay. It was working when I tested it earlier. No, hold on. Um, that's because, yeah, it was not on the PDF. All right, so my bio says, I try to be critical about type without coming across as a snob. So I do not design type, I do not sell type, but I write about it. So right now I work for Type Network, which is a conglomerate of independent foundries. We have now 20, we doubled in our first year. And uh, so we offer typefaces, quality, uh, from a diverse amount of uh, foundries from Russia all the way to the States with stops in Barcelona and Germany and so on. So I have my little place there. That's uh, the news, the blog. And the fact that I write about type, and I started to realize that a while ago, is that because I was raised by two teachers and that like defined what I do in life. So I want to give knowledge to other people and try it. I'm kind of like an evangelist for typography. My uh, most popular um, series is screen fonts about movie posters. That was my talk at the very first Beyond Telerand. But another effect by, from raising by, being raised by two teachers is I try to be an activist. I try to make things better. And this happened in uh, Barcelona, ATIPI, which is an annual conference for all the Thai people. And there was this talk about the current state of fonts. Um, the open type fonts, I don't know how many of you are aware of open type fonts. These are like, if you compare old fonts with open type fonts, it's like looking at an old VHS and then the Blu-rays. So it's an incredible advancement in technology. Unfortunately, the support and the especially the user interface in almost any software is very, very bad. So they didn't evolve at all in the 15 years since OpenType was launched. So there was this talk, and that was me like getting up, literally getting off my ass to try to improve something. If you want to improve something, get you off, off your ass and like ask questions, engage in conversation with the people responsible and try to improve things. So what happened is one of the people on the panel at the conference was Nadine Shaheen, and she said, you know what, let's start an open letter and let's talk to Adobe because they kind of like are the biggest player in the field. We found support from ilovetopography.com, it's a very influential typography website, and we start this whole thing with an open letter and then asking for signatures, and finally I wrote an article explaining why it was necessary that we improve the UI between humans and type on the computer. Of course, this made me think about where do we come from and how do we actually interact with language? Because what you all do is write text. If it's code, if it's visible on the website, we communicate through text. It's the most important way of spreading knowledge. So how do we interact with the written language? There's three things, calligraphy, lettering, typography. Calligraphy is what they were doing in the Middle Ages, when to want to uh, issue a book, they had to write it by hand. So what is important there is that as you're trying to get content on a page, there's a direct relationship between how you think, what you do with your hand, and getting the stuff visible. So direct relationship, you create your own letter forms. 
lettering is different because it's not writing, it's drawing. But still, you create your own letter forms. There's a big difference with typography. Now, there's many um, definitions for typography. The one I like most is the most elegant, is the shortest. Is typography is writing with prefabricated letters. So it is still writing, but the letters have been made for you. So you don't have to make them yourself. Somebody else made the letters, and you can use them to get content on a page. So how do we interact with these pieces of alphabets that somebody else made? So forget your history class. Johannes Gutenberg is not the inventor of movable type. We have to go back to the 12th century, uh, 11th century, where it was invented in China. The first movable type. Then a little later, it was in Korea, the first metal type. And then in China, again, the first movable wooden type. So this is the first recorded example of how we can see how people interacted with type. So those letters were put on this big rotating table, and you just could look at what you had and actually take what you needed and use it to compose type. So we have to wait 400 years after the actual invention of movable type that Johannes Gutenberg comes in play. Why is he important? Because he modernized the process. He made it like more, more fluid, more uh, efficient. Uh, he improved the printing uh, presses. But what interests us is this little section of his workshop. So what you see is a person taking letters from a box that looks like this. So the original way to interact with the type, like this is uh, a schematic of, uh, of a letter box, is that you think of a letter. I want a capital A. What you do is you look for it. You have this big box. Then you find it, so you take it, and then you compose it. So there is a direct connection between what your brain thinks, what you see, what you take, and the result. If you take a less common glyph, this FI ligature, you still can see it in that box. You can still can take it with your hand and compose it. So that's very important. And then for 400 years, almost nothing happened until the 1860s, where this was invented, the type machine. Type machine is not really for typesetting. It was more for the office environment, to be able to create you know, office correspondence and so on like in a, in a faster, more uh, efficient way. And there was the first important shift in paradigm, because what you see on the keyboard would be the capital A. You press the capital A, but you get lowercase a. So actually, you have to shift your expectations and not really go for what you see, but what you know will be there. So you want the capital A. You know you have to do the shift and the A, and then, then you have the capital A. It may seem like nothing, but that was the most important shift in how we interact with typography. And then, of course, after typewriter was invented, they tried to automate professional setting for newspapers, books, and so on, because taking letters took too much time. They wanted to have it more uh, efficient. So they invented the linotype machine. There's a great documentary about the linotype machine. If you can see it, go check it out. It's incredibly like educational. The monotype was there. Um, uh, competition, and you see that still there is this whole notion of you have to be able to see what you need. You have to be able to visually look, all right, I need this character, this letter, I can just type that one and it will get this result. And then something happened in the late 40s, early 50s, photo typesetting was invented. And there, instead of having the type in little metal bits, they were on film strips or little film rotators. But what is important is that even though it was a professional typesetting machine, they used the keyboard of the office environment. Because when you look at the keyboard of a photo typesetting machine, it looks, it looks like almost identical to a, a, um, a keyboard of a typewriter. You may wonder why. Well. It's a very sad reason. Um, the typesetters were unionized. So they said, you know, if we introduce a typewriter keyboard, we can hire typists, all women, so we can pay them half 
what unionized typewriters, uh, typesetters used to make. So it's a very like uh, negative way of approaching this problem. And then 1984, of course, the computer arrives, and they still have the keyboard of the typewriter. So now, if you need a special glyph, you're looking at your keyboard, and you're like, where is it? Because what you see is this, and it's very limited. So you kind of know that there are two modifying uh, modifier keys. Sorry, this is Mac-centric, because I work on Mac. It applies also on Windows environments. So you get the shift, and you get the option. And you know from the olden days that if you use it without the shift, even though you see capitals, you have the lowercase. When you use a shift, the capitals come up. But then you had the second one, the option, and that gives you the extra characters that formerly you used to see in your type case, and now you have to kind of know where it is. And Germans, for example, will see that the SZ is placed in a B, not because it's the same sound, but because it kind of looks like the B. So it's some of them are logical places, other ones are completely random. So you have to kind of memorize where everything is. So this makes interaction with type a lot more difficult. But what happened is that these typefaces only had 256 characters. You may think, that's enough. That's not true, because they then felt the need to have extra typefaces. That was a different typeface with all the sorts, all the small caps, ligatures, different kind of figures that we used in professional typesetting, in fine typesetting. And then 1998, it's a pivotal point, because then it's when OpenType was launched. So the big difference was now you had a single cross-platform file, so you didn't need Mac fonts or PC fonts. Very important, Unicode character encoding, the last time I checked, there's room instead of 256 characters, you have room for almost 140,000 characters from 140 scripts, and you have also multiple symbol sets and emoji. And then the advanced typographic layout features, which make your fonts sometimes look like they're magic. You type something, and then the previous letter or the next letter will change to make a better combination. So it's kind of intelligent typesetting. The problem is that you're still looking at those fonts through this little keyboard. And that's like looking at your typeface through a keyhole. Because what you see on the keyboard is this. Because of our experience with typewriters, we know that the lowercase is also accessible when you don't press the shift. But what is in this font that I show here is all of this. And you have no idea. So what was the solution, the first solution that Adobe came up with? They created this. This is a glyphs panel. Where you can find all those characters. Now, if this looks familiar, it is. Because you just go back to the very first days of movable typesetting, where you have this case, and you have to visually look for everything what, that you need. The problem is, of course, you're working on a computer. You should not be doing that work. You should not be searching for any character. It should be able to come up in a logical, automated way. So they added some improvements, like, for example, you have the drop-downs, where you can see all the different variations of the letter that you're looking for, but you can also narrow down your choices. For example, you want all the ligatures, and then you only see the ligatures that you might want to need. So when you go to InDesign, uh, and you went there just before we started working, finding all those, that richness in typography, all these features that could improve your typesetting, that could make you a better designer that could improve the layout of pages, both on paper and on the web. It was all like hidden away, because if you look there, there's no indication that there's anything advanced. So you have the character panel, but it doesn't say much. There's very, very little choice. So what you need to do is this, this little thing that you can almost not see is the fly out, and then you see, OK, there's a couple of more options, and then you see this one thing, open type. Okay. Let's try this. And then oh, we're running out. OK, so I'm going to move because we're running out of screen. And there you see all the special features. But if, for example, if you're an advanced designer, advanced typesetter, you may need stylistic sets. And then they're even further down. So this is not the best way. This is not UX or UI design that's sensible. Why did this happen? Because OpenType was launched. One of the major players was Adobe. And literally, I heard firsthand, the guy that was part of the Adobe Type team walked over 
to the guy that was working Adobe InDesign team. And he said, oh, we've got these great new typefaces and they have all these like, special things happening. We should be able to access them in InDesign, Illustrator, Photoshop. And the guy said, all right, that's a fun ID. Just give me one of those fonts. And so that developer from Adobe InDesign over weekend cobbled up something. And then I don't know if the managers or project uh, leads were mad about it or they just thought like, but they said, oh, that's good. So what you see actually is a proof of concept. It was never meant to be a user interface that was workable. Unfortunately, that's what we were stuck with for 15 years. Because they said, oh, we have it now, so that's OK. We, we leave it there. So that means that there's all kind of inconsistencies. For example, if you want to change the caps, small caps, all small caps, they're in different spots. There's even things that conflict. For example, the superscript and subscript in the normal menu, they don't work. They just make them smaller and lift them, while the other ones in the open time menu show you the actual glyphs. And then positional forms are also hidden. So all the richness that you could access in those fonts is actually very hard to access. Same thing in Illustrator, very consistent. They always found like, OK, Adobe, all the products are consistent in, in user experience. It's not true, because there you have the separate open type thing. And then you have all these little buttons. Many of them are missing. So you just try to find what you need, but this half of it is missing. Photoshop, same thing. So that was what I was protesting against in Barcelona at the ATIPI conference. And then I think two months after that, I got a call, well, first tweets and then email and so on. And uh, from Adobe, they said, all right, we heard you. We know that we've been neglecting this for I don't know how long. So we want to try and make it improve the, the whole uh, thing. So they set up the Adobe Typography Customer Advisory Board, and we started working. So it was announced uh, in December 2014. But So we're a group of people that are looking at the apps and try to make everything better for everybody, you. So there's our people also chiming in. Um, Chris Sowers, a great type designer, had uh, also Zara Evans had idea about our language, because sometimes in those type menus, I can imagine that once in a while you see a certain word that, what is this thing? So our language has, has to also be more accessible. So what are the user interface improvements since we have started this whole project? So. First, I don't know, Photoshop users in June 2015, certain, suddenly you had the glyphs panel. So before that, if you had needed a special character, you had to go to Illustrate or InDesign and then copy it and then go to Photoshop and paste it. Now you can see again the whole thing, like a letter case in front of you, and you can find the characters that you need. Then InDesign, the first major development was on canvas selection of alternate glyphs. And this is great. When you write something, you can select, and then you see as a drop down on canvas what the different possibilities are. So if you want to uh, fine tune your typography, you want to make it look a little nicer, a little neater, you can actually do that on canvas. And that's our whole movement as well, is trying to move away the interaction between the type user and the fonts move away from panels and drop downs, but actually make it an interactive experience while you were working on, on the canvas. Photoshop then also adopted. So again, so the three big players started from different code bases, like Illustrator was created first, then came Photoshop, then came InDesign. So even though they tried to integrate the whole experience, they are different code bases, so certain advancements only come later after a while after the first one was implemented in another app. And then, yeah, I'm going to cycle through this. I'm going to show you what happens. So what happens now is that when you select multiple features, you can see here, for example, if you don't like ligatures, you have the option to select the short F. But then there is this new thing that many people don't know. There's this little icon there. And that's the universal open type uh, symbol. When you click it, you see all the options for your typography. 
So if you want uh, the special thing with the short F, you just click that in the drop down. If you want uh, small caps, and it also shows you what changes. So we're trying to make these things easier to understand for any type user, because as long as you don't know what is possible, if you, for example, you, you're driving a Porsche and you only know where the first gear is, you're not gonna make any speed. You need to know, all right, but I can do these other things with what I'm working with. So same thing with fonts, like people don't know what typographic richness is available. And it's also available, of course, on the web. So there are, um, um, I'm gonna quickly show you something. For example, if you want to know, oh, shit. If you want to know what's available on the web, there is, for example, this, um, this website that shows like all the, all the features that you can use. And there's also similar things for, for browsers. So what's next? This is a work in progress. We've started on, on this journey uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. It's a long and difficult process because the advisory board, we do exactly what we do, so we advise. So we send out signals to development teams and we say like, as users, we understand what's going wrong. Could you please do this and this and this and this? But then of course at Adobe, the um, budget has to be allocated. The teams have to be like, make free time and like, work on this and then we see stuff coming back and sometimes it's not in the order that we think is most important but little by little it gets done. What is amazing is that originally Photoshop was really lagging behind when it came to type support but they have one developer, Vinod Balakrishnan, who is out there and now he's leading the charge and now Photoshop is the first one to implement the enhancements that we're asking for so that's really great. So one of the first things that we want to get away with is like we still have this character menu and open type menu that makes no sense because it's a division made on technology. When you are typing text, when you are making a web page, doing a layout, you're not thinking about technology. You're thinking about what is the basics and what can I do to really make people see that I know what I'm doing. I'm doing fine typography. This is the next level. This is not just some basic Verdana. Also, language. Language is really messed up here and there. Uh, people think that metrics, oh, that's done by a robot, and optical, oh, that's done by that, is the exact opposite. So metrics are just the spacing done by an expert type designer. Optical is just Adobe uh, software guessing what could be the best spacing. Same thing over and over again. Uh, stylistic sets, we want them to make more visible so you know that all the richness that you can access, that you can actually see it and like be able to use it. And the figure styles, of course, that's for now, you have to go to combinations. You want to make it a simple grid that you know what you're doing. And type section discovery. I guess everybody wants to know this type kit does efforts now that you can have similar typefaces, or you can show them a little scan and they say, oh, that's that typeface, so you can e uh, find your typeface more easily. Now, I rushed a little bit through my main presentation because I wanted to show you this. 14th of September, 2016, the OpenType spec 1.8 was announced. And this is, again, after 20 years almost, a major advancement in typography. And this is very important for anybody who works in web design. That's a major thing. Who of you is old enough to have been working with multiple masters, Adobe multiple master typefaces, a couple of you? So that was a technology that was launched. Actually, Illustrator used the same code base as their type design development. And they saw that you know the, the thing where you can morph from one shape to the other? They applied it to type design as well. And then I thought, you know, we use this to design the type. Maybe it would be nice to give it to the user. And then you had multiple master typefaces. So you had a certain typeface, you want a little bolder, a bit a little narrower, just to make your copy fit in the space that was available. Had some sliders and so on. Unfortunately, computing power was not there yet. Speed wasn't there yet, so that died a slow and painful death. But it's back, and now it's really implemented. And the good thing is, it is supported by all the major players. So the consortium that's working on it, it's Adobe, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. And they're making great advancements. So now we're 
a little more than one year in, and there's already results. The basic idea is that when you look at a certain time phase and you see the light and the bold, actually you could make a transition from one to the other. And that's what actually has already been used in some type production, just to try to find what is the best weight that you want to like, give to the user. Then we take the middle one. There's also application to width. And then when you apply it to the whole grid, then you have all these possibilities. Up till now, the only thing you can use are all the fixed instances. So you have certain families that are larger, certain families are like smaller, but you have a limited amount of options to play with. It's not the same thing as scaling, because every single instance is redesigned. So the actual narrow one will be properly designed, it's not just squished. So why open type font variants? So instead of having multiple files for a big family, you only have one file. And all the variations are in there. Oh, sorry. So kerning and hinting, especially for screen display, can be applied to a single set of type outlines. So there's less work involved. It has to be very well prepared, of course. The work is more complicated. But once you apply it to one set of outlines, then you can actually expand it to the whole family. And this is very important. You have considerably small font files. So when you're making a website and you want to have a typographic richness to show people what is headline, what is body, what is a caption, what is a little bit snippet of code, you do not have to s um, download all the fonts one by one. You have this one font file, and then the CSS will determine what kind of variation is visible to your user, and that can save up to 80% of bandwidth for certain websites with many typographic styles. Also, you can have, in responsive web design, your font adapt to your viewport. You can have a certain type style for large windows, but when you go to mobile, you can say, all right, I want a variation that's like 80%, so it's a better letter fit, there's slightly more characters per line, that improves the whole experience. Also, when you make type small, the little bits tend to disintegrate, so you can make sure that they're a bit more solid, so the optical sizes can be adapted. And this is very neat. Before, the multiple master fonts were a bit marked by the fact that even if you have a very well-designed lightest weight and a very well-designed boldest weight, Nothing can guarantee that the weights in between will be perfect. Sometimes you need a little bit different in the middle. Now you can install like breakpoints where your design changes from one shape to the other to make the best possible uh, representation. So I'm going to quickly showcase that on my computer. Uh, no. No. Um, I think I'm first going to show. Illustrator. Oh no. <laughs> so when you go in the latest release of Photoshop, it changed now it says um, properties. They're trying to get away from like the type menu and then the fill menu, whatever. They're just properties. So whatever you selected, it adapts uh, the, the whole interface. And you can show variable font usage. And again, we have lots of work to do. Again, it's a little bit hidden. But when you see this here, you have this little slider. And this is one single, so everything you see is one single font file. So imagine like having to send all the typefaces, or you're only having to send one. So, and if you drag the slider, you can really fine tune the weight until you have exactly what you need. And what I was talking about earlier, certain characters may present problems when they go too black. For example, the vertical uh, stroke in the dollar sign, it will like, mess with the whole counter being, becoming too um, uh, small. So if you increase the weight here, I hope it just shows it at some point. It's not really super fluid. I think you saw that. So problem avoided. But you can also have all the widths. 
then once you're in there, you can still change everything that you want. And then when you have, of course, only certain designs can do that, but because certain italics are designed a different way. But here you can change the slant to create an italic and have exactly the, the, the exact slant that you want. So Illustrator also works. And what is fun is that the menu, it's also a little bit hidden. That's why I'm showing this to you. Like if you want to use it, it's there. Um, it adapts to the available axis. So for example, here, when you look at, um, hold on, when you look at source sense, you see there's only a weight axis. Because this is a serif face, and like I explained, when you make this smaller, those fine serifs will disintegrate, will not work in, uh, when, uh, in screen rendering, not work as well. You can actually change the optical size by making it more uh, a little sturdier, making the, the serifs a bit thicker, a bit stronger, and increase the spacing so that you have the best possible uh, um, yeah, representation on screen. And so Google Chrome is the first browser that supports um, uh, variable fonts in a public release. And I um, invite you all to visit Access Praxis to start uh, playing with this. So what Access Praxis does is it offers an interface and a whole bunch of variable fonts just to allow users to start getting acquainted with the whole technology to understand the benefits that can be had. So when you select something, so here we're in heading one, this is a typeface, and you see that there's font size, line height, and alignment, but also font variation. And then you can go for instances. So you don't really have to look forever. You can already go, all right, I want a bold, select a bold. But then from there, you can really fine tune what you need exactly. And then from there, you can make it a little bolder, a little lighter, and so on. Also the optical size again. This is for headline if you want to make it for texts, a little looser spacing, a little larger head, um, X height. So when you go here, then you see there's also the width in this. So again, the interface only shows you what's available. So when you try here, you get a little narrower and um, a little wider. And what's really interesting is that you can go and check the CSX, uh, CSS. So what it allows you to do is that you can try what you want, and then you see in CSS what you have to define to get that instance that you have chosen for this font to show up properly in, in, your, in your website. So it makes it really um, very easy and very intuitive to, uh, to um, apply. So there's a whole bunch of typefaces that are now available for testing. So we're one year in into the technology, it's improving fast. The thing that gives us confidence is that the fact that, as I said, the four major players are all involved and they themselves understand its value because Google wants to have faster websites, so they want this technology for themselves as well. So this is going to become really uh, yeah, available very soon in commercial applications and uh, yeah, for everybody to use. And then the, the Thai foundries will have to follow suit and release the variable fonts. So you see there's a couple that are already available, but it's gonna quickly grow and, uh, and uh, yeah, to the, uh, to the, oh, this is the old one. So yeah, I just, I would invite you like to go in there, try out the te te technology, get accustomed to it, and you will uh, be amazed at what's possible. Now, these things that you saw, it's like weight, width, and optical size, and other uh, axes, are just part of the story. What Type Network is doing now is we are proposing other axes because we want even more fine, uh, finer control over our, um, our type. And there we have split up all these things into um, uh, 
the, the white and the black of every single aspect of your tie face. So here is the white that's getting increased. Here is the black, the opaqueness. So this is extra is transparency in uh, X direction. Um, opacity in X direction. So you see that in X axis, the, the black gets increased. So it's not just like width, but it's actually every single component of the tie face can be manipulated. Same thing in the Y direction, transparency, so the white increases. Here is um, the opaqueness in the Y um, direction gets increased or decreased, that's the black. Then you have, of course, the X height, which like a larger X height makes it easier to read in small sizes. These are the capitals. So you see there's a whole bunch of things happening and we're really working hard to get this technology to everybody as soon as possible. So if you want to take, these are the two uh, URLs, go there. It's gonna be soon. It's gonna save you a lot of bandwidth, it's gonna allow you better control over your type, and uh, yeah, it's gonna improve your work uh, tremendously. And that's about it. I wanna thank all those people, uh, especially like Michael Ninnis, product designer for InDesign Illustrator, who started the board, and Matthew Rex, who's been a, a rock for us. He's, he leads the Adobe Typekit um, team, and everybody who uh, provide me uh, images. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, go out and play with variable fonts because that's going to be the future. Thank you.